Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, Bennington Historical Society, part of Bennington Museum. Um, we have a Zoom presentation today. Again, I ask everybody to mute their audio and perhaps turn your video off and uh, we'll begin. Um, like I said, this is the Bennington Historical Society, part of the Bennington Museum. And today we got um, the program is the Zoom program, which is going to be recorded so you can watch it later if you want to go back and uh, do it again. Um, it's going to be a birthplace of Vermont, the 1771 Breckenridge standoff. And it's going to be done by Bob Hoare. Um, and Bob has been around for a while. He started studying the Battle of Bennington uh, at the Museum Research Library a couple of years ago. Uh, he's worked with Joe Parks and Tyler Resch to do this. Um, and he put together this story from available resources. And um, he's been involved with the Friends of the Bennington Battlefield and has served as a tour guide on that battlefield. He's also produced a study of the Continental Storehouse in Bennington. Uh, and that will probably be another presentation at a later date. Um, so he's involved, also involved with planning the 250th anniversary committee to commemorate the state's founding. Um, and he's currently lives in Bennington and he offers tours actually. Okay, we can catch those in the summer. Um, so I'd like to uh, like to welcome you all. I'd like to welcome the, the people from the uh, members of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum who are joining us today and others from around Vermont and from around, uh, I'm sure from around the country. Um, so we're gonna have our Zoom presentation and when it's over, uh, we'll take questions and at that time you can uh, turn yourselves back on again and we can, we can do questions and answers. Uh, we'll talk about that later. I'd also like to welcome, uh, if they're here today, uh, Christopher Page, uh, who's I believe his father or grandfather, that's Martin Page, uh, who is actually a, a, a relative of the Breckenridge family. So we got some true historic lineage going on today. So here we are, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bob uh, for the actual Zoom presentation. Robert, you're on. Okay, thank you. Now that wonders of technology take place here, he's gonna share a screen. Here we go. Hello, everyone. My cover image is a painting of the Breckenridge standoff, July 1771, viewed from the inside of the house. This depiction is on the west wall of the Rutland, Vermont post office lobby, above the elevator. One of the lobby murals depicting scenes from Vermont history. Eight men who seem to be militia, all armed with muskets, are crowded into a house. One man is seated as if a meeting may have been held. A red coat sheriff outside the window is speaking with them. He is accompanied by some very uneasy looking men. Possibly some are unarmed, but the sheriff firmly holds an ax. A crowd is in the distance, back by a curve in the road. In this case, they are the rest of the sheriff's support. On the table, paper, quill, and ink. Perhaps some papers have been considered and gone unsigned. The crossed muskets symbolize the houses defended. A pitcher sits on the windowsill in a fragile position. You get the sense that the moment is becoming tense. This is the story of the birthplace of Vermont, the Breckenridge standoff. It is one of my Green Mountain Boys tours. There is a sign at the Henry Bridge in North Bennington 
Uh, there's a new sign at the Henry Bridge in North Bennington. This history sign explains uh, the Breckenridge standoff and also the mill and the dam that were once there. So this will be a tour of historic locations. It's gonna mimic my walking tours that I've started to do um, from the Henry Bridge over to the, the Breckenridge standoff in the summer. Um, it's also gonna talk about the 20 mile line controversy you know, between New Hampshire and New York over the land that would become Vermont. It'll be a chronological um, story that'll give you the background information that'll bring us up to 1771 when the standoff occurred. And from there, there'll be a few more stories. Um, I have the Battle of Bennington on Facebook. So if you wanna contact me, like me on Facebook or message me there, that's one way to do it. So like I said, this is um, a walking tour, but it's also sort of a driving tour of a few locations around the Bennington area. This is the Green Mountain Boys flag. There was an armed confrontation over land, specifically James Breckenridge's farm on Murphy Road in Bennington, Vermont. In the 1750s, New York and New Hampshire both had claims to the land that would become disputed territory. Note the very relevant British military map made in 1765 that it shows Vermont as a part of New England. When New Hampshire and Massachusetts adjusted their border when they moved it south, New Hampshire would then garrison Fort Dummer in Brattleboro over the river. This gave, he thought, New Hampshire Governor Benning Wentworth claim to the land past Connecticut River. Um, this map shows um, a line of forts along the southern border and eastern border of what would become Vermont. Um, these were for King George's War. Note Fort Massachusetts just below Pownall and Bennington. We'll talk about that briefly later. Note Fort Dummer, which I just mentioned in the upper right. And most of these forts were garrisoned by Massachusetts militia from Deerfield. And Deerfield, um, the men from Deerfield were many of the original grant holders for the town of Bennington. So the governors communicated and Bennington was chartered to stake the claim 20 miles from Hudson River. It would complete the border of New England with New York. So New Hampshire Governor Benning Wentworth sent a letter to New York Governor George Clinton, 1750. I granted one township due north of the Massachusetts line of the contents of six miles square and by measurement 24 miles east of the city of Albany presuming that this government was bounded by the same North and South line with Connecticut and Massachusetts Bay before it met with his majesty's other governments. There were earlier border adjustments, New York um, with Connecticut and New York um, with Massachusetts, um, but more famous than those, and what's really remembered is Vermont's border adjustments with New York and the Green Mountain Boys. And Vermont was mainly settled by people moving north from Western Connecticut and Western Massachusetts who were involved in or familiar with these, event, these events, um, notably Ethan Allen. So just some notes on some of the differences between um, the the colony of New York and the um, New England colonies. New York was settled in larger grants um, and counties in large aristocratic manors and plantations. Um, those leaders were called patroons. Um, first it was settled by the Dutch. Then it was a Catholic tolerant colony when England took over the Dutch colony. And New York's beginnings at that time were simultaneous with James the second, the Duke of York's founding of the Royal African Company, um, spearheading England's involvement with the slave trade. New England was settled by Protestant religious, free, religious freedom seekers, and it basically would consolidate into um, the Puritan church. So it became sort of like um, towns in England. Um, so it's a sort of a difference between some of the plantations and the work camps in New, New York 
North Carolina and in Virginia. Um, so that's just some of the differences in, in the settlement patterns there. Only New York's Willooms Act patent, 1739, predated Bennington, 1749, and they overlapped. So Wentworth probably did not know about or care about this unsettled tract. The settlers here, Belgian French Walloons, were mostly captured, killed, or moved away because of King George's War in the 1740s. The Scaticoke Indians, who sold the Walloomsack patent to the New Yorkers, were participating in this war with the French, which is known for the burning of Fort Massachusetts um, in today's North Adams, which I showed you the map of before. And then the, those Indians would settle in Canada um, by 1750. So there's no specific wording in this or any New York grant stating in any way that it marked or advanced New York claims to the east, you know, towards the Connecticut River. So even in the wilderness, the pioneers and settlers know where the border is. Bennington was surveyed at precisely the ancient 20 mile line from the river. So what it does is it really states the claim. Um, and despite any curves of the river, um, this north and south line right here in Bennington is what's gonna be um, Vermont's border. So the start of the confrontations. In 1764, Samuel Robinson, Bennington's founder and leader, was arrested in Powell near the Petersburg, New York line, evicting Yorkers over the line as a New Hampshire justice of the peace. So he was with several others. New York sent a 30-person mounted sheriff's posse and arrested him and those three others um, in North Powell, Vermont. And they would spend two months in Albany jail. As a reaction to this, the first Bennington Militia Company was formed when Robinson, the leader, was in the Albany jail. Um, so John Fassett, who was the leader of the Continental Storehouse Movement, was the captain, and Jane, James Breckenridge, our protagonist in this story today, was the lieutenant. Uh, here's a painting of Cadwallader Cold in one of the New York governors. So here's one of the important facts today. Um, so after New Hampshire had started um, granting lands, um, in 1764, the King of England issued the famous Board of Trade ruling stating the eastern border of New York to be the Connecticut River, not had been, giving New York and the Crown jurisdiction to the land. Remember, I showed you the map, the military map from 65, so all maps before this ruling would show Vermont as part of New Hampshire or um, New England. So instructions were to, were to have the settlers pay for the land from New York and pay them rents. This is Governor Benning Wentworth from New Hampshire. In 1765, uh, Wentworth is recalled, having made a fortune on the grants. So he was basically fired, and this was a part of the royal prerogatives. So talking about the Stamp Act and the Currency Act and some other things that we'll uh, get to in a moment. 130 towns were created by Benning, with Bennington the leading settlement. So this is the, um, we're talking about the proclamation of 1763, one of those acts by the king. As a part of the French and Indian War and the proclamation of 1763, Western settlements were to be curbed and controlled and colonists were to help pay for that war. New York becomes lockstep with the king and his policies. Um, both were Tories. The New Englanders were mainly Whigs. So these are political parties. Um, political divisions were a part of this upcoming confrontation, as were the settlement types and to some degree religion, okay? Um, so that proclamation line, you can see it on the map there, um, it goes through Vermont um, and it restricts, you know, basically white settlers um, within that line that has to do with the Indian reservation there. Um, so most historians ignore this relationship between the proclamation of 63 and that board of trade ruling in 64, giving New York jurisdiction to the Connecticut River, okay? But within this document, um, England tipped, tipped their hand. So within the same document, it sort of foreshadows um, what New York would, would end up doing. And we'll get to that. So the crown takes control. 
From the start, Benning Wentworth's authority was disregarded by the Yorkers, while he was actually the longest serving colonial governor, about 30 years. His grant settlers were treated as individual trespassers. To acknowledge a power behind these grants was to recognize them and New Hampshire authority, which New York colonial governors would not. Therefore, we have stories from New York about a few lawless vagabonds um, and the Bennington mob. Um, this is just a section from the Zadok Thompson woodcut um, um, showing the, the man with the beach seal. So we're talking about um, the Green Mountain Boys using long twigs or sticks, um, gagging, tying, just other um, intimidation means that were a part of um, the Green Mountain Boys story. But don't worry, New York did all the sort of same things. Um, in New York City, for instance, they had a, a public whipper. New York began having the land surveyed prior to repayment of fees to New York. New York would also regrant much of Wentworth's grants in the form of contrasting lines, not six by six uh, mile squares, which were the king's preference, um, but irregular or along rivers, the grants were. So these were known as paper towns and paper counties because they existed only on paper and most of them attracted a uh, few settlers. So just note the difference between the grid and those irreg irregular um, grants there. And these happen to be some grants related to um, James Duane's interests. And we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit later. In 1767, Bennington founder Samuel Robinson went to London with the hope that the grants would be re-annexed to New Hampshire. The settlers had legal advice and seemed to expect this outcome. Samuel Robinson dies there. Um, he was too poor to press the claim, some said. Yet in 1763, a restraining decree versus New York governors to stop this particular regranting, it was called the 49th Article, or um, incur the king's highest displeasure, would embolden the grant settlers. So this is really the, the hope that created the confrontation. So it's a pushback on the 64 ruling giving New York jurisdiction um, um, and those contrasting grants that they were making. At the same time, New Hampshire is backing out. Benning Wentworth and his successor, John Wentworth, that's the picture there, they had abandoned the grant settlers in increments. The grant settlers um, didn't see this. The Bennington Town Plan here um, shows John Wentworth's grant. So John Wentworth and Benning Wentworth had grants of land in most of the towns in Vermont, including Bennington. Um, and ironically, I think my house is on lot 52 in Bennington. Um, so there were a blizzard of New York governors. So no really time to explain uh, that aspect of this. This is Governor Henry Moore. He is an unknown key to understanding this complex situation. Um, so why were there no evictions in Bennington? Um, just talking about why were there no evictions in Old Bennington, um, the Deweys, the Facets, and the Robinsons. Um, Moore, before the passing of the 49th article, which we just talked about, revealed that Cole, Eben, Ebenezer Cole from Shaftesbury and seven, eight, seven or eight others, the Robinsons, had their lands given to them by him without paying any fees of office including patents made for them. Um, Robinson and his associates, according to Moore, never thought to make use of the indulgence given to them um, of confirming their settlements. So they don't go after uh, some of the main settlers in Bennington. They go after the, um, some of the peripheral settlers. Um, and there's some reasons for that. So among the contesting land was a grant to Major John Small and Shaftesbury. So just below where it says Shaftesbury, the SH, you'll see John Small. So this is one of those soldiers grants. He was from the, he was a soldier from the French and Indian War, part of the French, the proclamation of 1763, like I, I told you it was going to happen. Um, so Small placed a tenant on his land. Isaiah Carpenter also claimed the land or nearby under a Shaftesbury grant. 
and he chased off this tenant and also refused to have his land surveyed. His home still stands on West Mountain Road. New York made a big deal out of this. So did he get violent or was he representing the claimants and drawing the line as a leader? Um, so I think about the, the beach seal image, perhaps um, something like that is what happened with Isaiah Carpenter and John Small's um, tenant. So here's a, an older picture of the Carpenter home, which still exists on West Mountain Road, a relic of the Green Mountain Boys era. Um, so the ejectment trials are at first aimed at Carpenter and Shaftesbury. New York homed, hoped to win one case and the rest would fall with it. It's called a test case. So there's a little bit more to explain, but he will lose in court. The evidence from New Hampshire attorneys was not allowed. In 1769, Isaac Sawyer from Hoosick, you can see on the left it says Hoosick, um, served area residents with public notices stuck up in their doors concerning the upcoming trials. Notices were printed in the newspapers as well in New York and in Connecticut. So some of these events were foreshadowed. While surveying near today's Park McCullough House, the Yorkers were warned. They were overtaken on the road by Jedediah Dewey, who was the pastor of the New Light Separatist Church in Bennington and a mounted posse. Dewey and his men waited for the surveyors to finish, forcing them to ride back through the ambush. That night, a 500 person petition was created concerning re-annex to New Hampshire. So again, um, the town is unified before these confrontations and you can see that they are continuing the cause of Samuel Robinson who died uh, a martyr for the cause in London. The next day at the State Line House in Shaftesbury, the, the Yorker surveyors were stopped and a parlay ensued. The surveyors were now accompanied by John Monroe and other officials. After the parlay, tensions remained high and James Breckenridge said he would rather spill his heart's blood than to see his land divided. So there would have been an earlier house there, um, Ephraim Pierce's house and the state line house is on the same location, okay? So Breckenridge and others would threaten and stop the surveyors and he becomes the second target and test case in the trials. We told them, we understood his majesty had forbade them making any grants on ours or, or hindering our settlements. We told them we did not see as they had any right to run over the 20 mile line. So clearly he knows about the 49th article. Were the New Yorkers equally aggressive? Would stopping the surveyor change the settler's status to one not deserving equity? Was this response cultivated? So here's just a map. Um, and you can see just to the, to the left of the current Volumsack River um, bed is an older riverbed um, crossing a tree line. And I believe it was here that could be the location of this important confrontation in the history of the state of Vermont. So anyways, here's a quote from John Lansing, one of those surveyors, then stop us or break our chain. Um, so I don't really use a lot of the rhetoric to tell this story, like a lot of other people um, focus on the rhetoric in the Green Mountain Boys stories, but there's a little bit of it there and it was, um, it was on both sides. So we never knew that they had a confrontation there at the state line until recently. So everyone basically thought that three confrontations had happened at the Breckenridge house. Um, it was only one, and we're gonna get to that, of course. Um, so I'm telling a story that has been in part lost to time, and what was known had become simplified, almost to the point of being thought of as one event. So you can see, this is the state line house again. There's the two little tiny obelisk markers in the front yard, those are the state line markers for Vermont and New York. So once again, to recap on that, 
Breckenridge's prominent role in this confrontation, occupation of land straddling the 20-mile line within the Loomsack patent, propelled that case ahead of the others and caused New York to then assert their rights to all of the land Breckenridge claimed east of the line. This is a picture of the Albany City Hall um, where the ejectment trials would have occurred. So we're talking about the ejectment trials now. So the New Yorkers only focus on winning at those ejectment trials and the right to the land from that. The trials were not about jurisdiction or equity. It was another form of trial based on individuals and their admission of jurisdiction just by going to Albany for trial. So remember this, the proclamation of 1763, the king um, wanted to control how the land is settled. So this is happening through his New York governors. Um, um, Ethan Allen is thought of as a defective lawyer who procured faulty documents for the trial lawyers, which were dismissed, like Carpenter's evidence. Um, New Yorkers were warned after the trials by Ethan Allen that the gods of the valleys were not the gods of the hills. Um, so I've been working with this information for a couple of years now, and in my larger story, Ebenezer Cole of Shaftesbury is sort of my protagonist as a, as a Yorker in the Bennington area. So this is Ebenezer Cole's Shaftesbury Munitions House, which still stands on Buck Hill Road in South Shaftesbury. So my new storyline and research, the Shaftesbury of Carpenter was not on Small's land. Um, he was convinced by Ebenezer Cole, who was being regranted the town by New York, he was on Small's land. And then by lawyers, that he was over the 20-mile line, which he was. But like I said, the grant's claim is based on Bennington being 20 miles from the river and the, the river curves. So um, not having the evidence they needed, this was a critical deception of Carpenter. Did Ebenezer Cole partner with Major John Small in resolving the settlers' issues in the process, siding with New York? Here's a picture of James Duane. Um, so as for Breckenridge, adamant in defense at first, both he and Carpenter may have been, become persuaded by the New York lawyers and accepted false information concerning the facts of their claim. Um, so I showed you the map, the overlapping grants that were James Duane. So he was a claimant and an attorney. Um, and he was ever present throughout the blizzard of the New York governors, okay, at this time. So he's really the writer and the builder of the legal case versus the New Hampshire grants. There's a picture of Major John Small. So the New Yorkers, they win at court in Albany, like I said, and um, John Small was at, represented the claims in Albany at the court. So he had been one of the 21st North British Fusiliers or the Black Watch at Ticonderoga. Um, Abercrombie's famous um, failed assault at the French lines. The New Yorkers, having won at court, do not want to evict anyone. They want jurisdiction and rents, and for the grant settlers to form and fill New York government offices. Some time would go by for this. So um, Shaftesbury, note Shaftesbury, the underline means that the town did not pass the seals. So I've relabeled it to Ebenezer Coltrane. There would be a confrontation somewhere near the bottom of Harwood Hill in Bennington, stopping more surveyors. I call it the Hathaway confrontation. Weeks later, Silas Robinson, who was at the confrontation, would be arrested at his home and spend a year in jail. Ebenezer Cole of Shaftesbury, now a New York magistrate, helped the sheriff, Monroe from Shaftesbury, so this is the second confrontation thought to have been at Breckenridge's house. So you can see sort of the theme of my tours to show you locations around um, town. Um, and so in Shaftesbury, this is the Universalist Church in South Shaftesbury, known as Cole Hall now, built in the 1830s. But it really represents um, Shaftesbury and its history with the Cole family. So Ebenezer Cole and Shaftesbury preacher Bliss Willoughby Bliss Willoughby thought the trials in Albany were wholly fair. 
Shaftesbury seems to have effectively become the Ebenezer track, the Ebenezer coal tract for a few years. This faction would stand up to the Bennington mob. The term Bennington mob is the most used description of the Grant settlers by New Yorkers at this time. When Monroe evicted Isaiah Carpenter in Shaftesbury, when he broke down his door with an ax and served him his papers, Carpenter had a musket loaded with kidney beans. So here we go, the pressure is on, Shaftesbury is being lost and Carpenter had been served. So here we go with my walking tour of the birthplace of Vermont. Breckenridge's farm lay within 17 miles of Hudson, Hudson's River and greatly to the westward of what even the government of New, New Hampshire had admitted to be the jurisdiction of New York. James Breckenridge loses in court after admission that his property was within 20 miles of Hudson River. How did this happen? You can see this is a Google um, Earth image showing that Breckenridge's house is actually 21.83 miles from Hudson River. It was his defense at the state line house, which is about 18 miles from Hudson River, that would cause him to be the target in these cases. So he was defending the town um, where the state line house is, was really on the governor's right. So um, he was acting as a leader, as the lieutenant of the militia in defending the grants. A 300 person mounted posse came to evict Breckenridge, actually just served papers, including the mayor of Albany, the sheriff, lawyers, all the magistrates, and it was filled out by the locals, basically the local militia, um, with few guns. Perhaps six men were posted as guards at Henry Bridge. Or perhaps the 300 person mounted posse confronted some of around 200 um, of the Bennington militia. So the posse was stopped and negotiating began. Albany Sheriff Ten Egg makes the first of two trips to Breckenridge's house. With the lawyers, a parlay ensued at the now fortified Breckenridge house. Loopholes were cut in the walls to shoot out and a flag could be raised up the chimney to communicate. The settlers were read the papers. They were asked to withdraw. They did not. The sheriff returned to the bridge but could only convince 30 of 300 to follow him back to the house. You can sort of see that 30 up on the, the curve of the road. There are two very visible ridges north and southeast of the Breckenridge house. The militia occupied these, rid these ridges, concealing their numbers and protecting them all within musket range of the house. So you can see the diamond, that's the um, marker for the James Breckenridge house and the ridge marked with the oval. That's the north ridge and here's the southeast ridge. So this is the ambush that was set up. Um, that's my diagram of what I'm describing to you now. The traditional story is that when Sheriff Tanak went to split the door with an ax, which is a basic move and his job, and had happened to Carpenter and Shaftesbury, the level muskets and the threats and the heat of the moment caused him to stop. Um, it is my story that it is possible that a mariner with a posse actually stopped the mayor, actually stopped the sheriff as he sensed the danger. Um, so there's a picture of me doing one of my walking tours um, and I'm explaining how I think it's possible that the, the sheriff was, was stopped by a mariner um, maybe physically with a bear hug or who knows how that happened. Um, the Breckenridge marker was put in in 1927 by the, Bre the Bennington chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And it marked the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Bennington, okay? Um, somehow fittingly 
there's a lone bullet hole in the marker there. Um, this would be the decisive moment in the land grants controversy. No longer would New York governors attempt to evict grant settlers. They would focus on creating the counties and related officers where they could in Vermont. Um, the east side of Vermont was much more pro-New York at this time, okay? Um, a race to claim and survey Northern Vermont would, assume, would ensue. This would be the birthplace of Vermont and a good choice as the synthesis of the Green Mountain Boys. Now proactive, the Green Mountain Boys would riot for two weeks on Cross Hill Road in Shaftesbury, culminating in the tearing down of local Yorker leader, John Monroe's house in Shaftesbury. So of course I've located all that across the road in Jasbury. Um, it's another defense at the border. The, the left of the picture is the New York Vermont border. All the way to the right, you can see um, my homestead where I grew up. Um, so I'm on the map there. So a hundred men from the New Hampshire grants defended this cross farm. Um, Samuel Gardiner under New York's balloon sack patent um, lived on a divided farm there with Ichabod Cross. Um, that's now the location of Kimberly Farms in Shaftesbury. A new New York governor, William Tryon, came up from North Carolina in 1771. There he had put down an uprising in the countryside. He had killed some in battle and he'd hung the leaders. This is known as the Battle of Alamance. Note the date, May 16th, 70, 1771. So just a couple of months before um, Breckenridge standoff, and now this governor's in New York. Fearing the same result and having faulty information about redcoats coming to Bennington, Ethan Allen ob obtained from Fort Hoosick in Williamstown, Massachusetts, two cannon and a mortar. They guarded the narrow passage to town and gave instructions to shoot the governor or the officers first. This invasion didn't happen. some of the markers for the Battle of Alamance. Um, the regulators were objecting to, track, to taxes for Tryon's royal palace in New Bern. Um, that's a picture of that. Um, the, the regulators situation was very different from the Green Mountain, situ, uh, Green Mountain Boys situation, okay? In North Carolina, so little land was available to the immigrants, the poor, um, in turn offering few chances and really creating a different culture in New England. <laughs> Where were the Green Mountain Boys born? So that's a part of this discussion. The Green Mountain Boys could have been born at a meeting at the Catamount Tavern, pictured here. Um, one of these deciding moments in 69, 70 or 71, one of those nights they created one of those petitions could have been seen as a group choice to defend their lands and speculation land up north. Um, this could be a non-confrontational start of the Green Mountain Boys. So, I really feel that the, the church, the New Light Separatist Church of Bennington really extended its brotherhood to the whole town. And that's part of the Green Mountain Boys story. Um, so there's the Green Mountain Boys in council at the Catamount Tavern in Old Bennington. And there's the full image of the Zadok Thompson woodcut showing um, Samuel Adam, Adams of Arlington um, being shamed. Um, he would actually go and join the, join the British during Burgoyne's invasion of 1777 and have his own um, ranger company. Uh, there's the catamount for the catamount tavern marker in Old Bennington when it was showing up um, in town and it was colorized by Tim Wagar. Thank you for that. Why does the catamount face west? Well, this presentation is answering that question. So the aftermath of the Battle of Bennington. My tours would then proceed um, explaining that James Breckenridge became a Tory. He would go to England for the settlers cause and seems to have turned then. He and his sons and son-in-law gathered horses and supplies for the British at the farm for the Battle of Bennington. The barn foundation is, is visible, you can see that, as is the well for the Breckenridge house just behind the marker. 
Breckenridge and his son would be banished by the Vermont Council of Safety and spend time as Queen's Loyal Rangers helping the British in Northern Vermont. As times would have it, he made amends, returning to town and is buried at the old First Church Cemetery. So um, the aftermath of the Battle of Bennington includes the story that by six o'clock, 450 prisoners had made it to Old Bennington. And our stories are that the battle had began at three o'clock precisely. So that's very quick for um, most of the soldiers um, to have made it eight miles away, okay? So they would have come through this area where I'm giving my walking tour by the Henry House and the Breckenridge House. Um, the prisoners, some of the prisoners actually stayed in um, probably at Seth Warner's house and the Henry house, these houses that we're talking about here. So as we would walk back on my walking tour, we would, we would talk about Seth Warner's homestead, which is between the um, Murphy Bridge and Breckenridge's house, okay? So Seth Warner, actually he was a defendant in those ejectment trials. Um, and he lived, like I said, right on that road. But we don't have any stories concerning him at the famous standoff. Um, but we do know that on New Year's Day, he's training the militia for that invasion that I, I spoke of, um, possibly near, near here, and possibly defending on um, that bridge again. So some of the objectives for the British at the Battle of Bennington are, are in this area. So that's why I'm showing you that this map. So Breckenridge's farm and mills, gathering supplies for the British. Um, Stark's camp was just up the road where General Stark and his men sp spent two days before the Battle of Bennington. Um, the British would have been interested in Haviland's Mills in North Bennington. They would have been interested in, like I talked, I mentioned Ebenezer Cole's munitions house in Shaftesbury. Um, and of course, 3,000 3, civilians were in Bennington, like the refugees from Northern Vermont had been fleeing the, the British. Um, the Continental Storehouse, which of course is the object of the British attack at the Battle of Bennington. So um, just talking about some of those things. So there's a, a picture of the Stark encampment just up the road from the Henry Bridge. And a little further along, you'll come to the marker for Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum's gravesite. He was the leader of the British at the Battle of Bennington. There's a there's a painting of the image of the wounded bomb being brought into that house where he would die of his wounds after the battle. So I showed earlier the Shaftesbury Munitions House and we talked about Ebenezer Cole, the sort of the local Yorker. Um, Ebenezer Cole's son's Parker's house is across the street and it's a very mysterious colonial, colonial era, era house and mill complex. So there's a secret tunnel that goes from the foreground into that um, the corner of the house there. Um, so the story of Ebenezer Cole is becoming clear now that we understand his involvement with the Yorkers in the settlement of uh, Vermont. And there's a little close up of um, Helen Olney who still lives there um, in that secret tunnel. This is a painting of Highland Hall Highland Hall and the origins of the birthplace Vermont marker. It is scarcely possible to overestimate the importance in the New York controversy of this discomfiture of the sheriff and his posse. It not only gave confidence to the New Hampshire claimants in their ability to defend their possessions, but served to convince their opponents that the feelings of the body of their own people were in unison with those of the settlers and that any attempt to gain possession of the disputed lands by calling into public action the civil power of the providence would, would necessarily prove unavailing. This defeat of the New York claimants was the entering wedge that eventually severed the New Hampshire grants from a province to which they had been without their knowledge annexed by the arbitrary will of the crown. Here, in fact, on the farm of James Breckenridge was born the future state of Vermont. That was me quoting Highland Hall. 
So I want to thank a lot of people who helped me for this um, presentation. Um, Tyler Rash in the Bennington uh, Museum Research Library, Ted Rice. Um, I need to thank Gary Shattuck. I used an image of his and I paraphrased his book a couple of times. Um, don't forget our heritage in, heritage in Vermont about the Green Mountain Boys and our Vermont National Guardsmen. One more quote for us. This is from Henry Moore. How else, the offspring of a very bad heart, should a man of one of the lowest and meanest of occupations at once set up for a statesman and from a notion that the wheels of government are as easily managed and conducted as those of a wagon take upon himself to direct the king's ministers in their departments. Talking about Samuel Robinson, Bennington's founder, who can plead little merit in the service of his majesty in the last war, which I am told here was little more than that of driving an ox cart for the settlers. Um, I should mention that Windsor is also known as the birthplace of Vermont. Um, there are plans underway for some celebrations around the 250th anniversary of the Breckenridge standoff, which will be this summer, July um, 18th on a Sunday. So for more information about that, contact me at um, Battle of Bennington on Facebook or the Bennington Museum. Um, a picture from one of my walking tours, um, a meeting discussing the 250th commission um, of celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Bennington in 2027. So meeting with Governor Scott um, in the monument right there, talking about those plans. So that is my story of the Breckenridge standoff, 1771. And I wanna thank everyone very much. Hello. Okay, I guess we're back. Um, my video is not working, so you, can you hear me out there? I can. Okay. Um, well, that was an excellent presentation. Oh, my video is starting. Just a minute, please. Oh, here we go. Um, well, that's the great presentation, Bob, as usual. Um, at this time, we can have questions. So again, turn on your audio and video if you want to participate. Or you can uh, put your questions in the chat room so we can take those questions now. We have a couple questions in the chat room. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Another thank you and another thank you. So we got some thank yous. You are welcome. <laughs> I have one question for you. Exactly where is that state line house? So on Route, Route 67, between Shaftesbury and Hoosick is the state line house, and it's built right on the border of New York and okay. Vermont, and I guess it's in three different counties as well. It's both in Rensselaer and Washington County, New York. Okay. And the, the, the Carpenter House on West Mountain Road, is it still standing? It sure does, and it looks a lot better than that picture I showed. Um, and it has the most amazing view of the Bennington area. Sounds like a road trip for me. Uh, we got some more questions here. Um, and O.C. says, I'm a descendant of Samuel Robinson. Wow. <laughs> Were any of his sons involved in the Breckenridge affair? Yeah, so it's, it's really important that Samuel Robinson Jr. was really one of the main characters, one of the, the few main characters there. Um, I wish I could tell you a little bit more about him, like maybe show you where I thought he lived in Bennington, but that work still needs to be done. Okay. Another kudo to you. Um, a question from Christopher Page. Lieutenant Breckenridge's wife was Mary Moore, her maiden name. Any chance she was related to Governor Moore? Any influence that way? 
I guess I would have to say I don't know the answer to that question. I would sort of doubt it. Or the research, perhaps. Yeah, it's a good question. I wonder if you might, here's a question. I wonder if you might talk a little about the eventual conditions of statehood, though I know it's not the focus of the talk, which was great, thanks. Um, the conditions of statehood, uh, that's a sticky question to ask me because um, <laughs> um, I'm someone who maybe isn't as proud of the 1791 statehood as others are because to me, it's a tragedy. Um, all the players involved with the formation of the state of Vermont um, were gone by then. Um, and um, Vermont paid New York $30,000 in Spanish money um, to settle the claims. And actually it's been sort of a sort of a thought of mine that maybe we could set up some sort of debate and perhaps Vermont could get a symbolic $30,000 back from New York because we all should have been on the same page as <laughs> colonies in the first place. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess the real the, the dispute wasn't settled until that time with 1783 or it was. Yeah, so they really kept Vermont from being a state for quite a while. And like I said, the tragedy part is that the glory of statehood that we had fought for you know, Ticonderoga, the Breckenridge standoff, the Battle of Bennington was, well, it didn't happen for many of those main players. Well, we ended up as a republic for all those years. That was a somewhat of a victory. And that's right. That is right. And Re Re Rebecca says that uh, Vermont should still be a republic. Maybe Woo! we succeed from the end again. <laughs> um, let's see here. We got some more questions. Um, did, uh, did Bennington uh, Wentworth uh, know when he was giving out the grants that ownership or rights to the property was questionable? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, so I think that really, um, I think that New Englanders and New Hampshire had, had the better claim to the land that would become Vermont. But that's, that's one heck of a story for anyone to go ahead and answer their own version of that question. There's a lot of, there's a lot to read about that. Well, Christopher Page says, thank you for the outstanding presentation. Happy birthday belated to Marvin Page, his father. Um, his mom was a Breckenridge uh, after was her maiden name. So they got some, we got some direct descendants here. Happy birthday. Today is your day. Uh, Vermont can still be a republic. Um, do any of the New York courts or prison records still exist? If so, where would they be available? Are these, these records are still available, aren't they? Didn't the, the people who wrote that book have the records available? Yeah, you're right. So the records have really only been recently sort of discovered. And I got a lot of the information today from um, The Rebel and the Tory, written by um, Gary Shadow. So that's a book that came out about a year ago from Vermont Historical Society. And that book is all about the, the court documents that they, for the first time, um, took a look at. So I think that book will answer your questions about those documents and where they are. It's amazing when they wrote that book, how they came across those documents, which nobody had ever seen before. Um, I forget, where, were they in Albany or were they in New York City? They're in New York City someplace, I believe. But uh, what a thrill it must have been to find those records. Yeah, good idea to go find those things. <laughs> there you go. Well, another road trip. Um, let's see. Um, question here. I was, um, I was interested to see in an early, early four-volume history how the $300,000 was apportioned to various names and those who thought they helped patent ownership rather than to New York. So he's asking, he's stating toward us. Um, uh, the money was not given to the state, but given to those who, who thought they held patent ownership. It was given to the individual claimants. So one of them is uh, uh, Goldbrow Banyard, who was um, involved in almost all those transactions throughout all those years um, when all the 
the governors kept um, having their hand in the grants and making their their pot of money when they had the chance. This one gold brow banyard was there the whole time. So he's one of the more prominent names and larger recipients. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> As is James Dwayne. Uh -huh. um, James, D James uh, John Devino says uh, he has a copy of a 1749 map of Bennington at the Ethan Allen Homestead. I think that's the map you showed. Um, yeah, the, the lotting map. Yeah, the 64 lots. Um, do you know if any of those names listed are actually owners, listed as owners, actually lived in Bennington? Did any of them ever actually? Wait, essentially none of them. So you can see on that map, I wish I could show you the image, but there's an original map of 64 lots, and there's one name for each lot. Most of those names are the Williams. And I explained that the, the Williams family is the main family from Deerfield, okay? And you also find the Wentworths on that. Um, there's one name that's written above a name, and that's the name of Samuel Robinson. And that ink is a little darker than the other oh. ink. So before Robinson went to London, it appears that the same clerk from New Hampshire, the same handwriting, yeah. wrote in his name on the town grant chart to fortify his case when he went to London. <laughs> yeah, they've got that. They've got that map at the uh, at Bennington uh, town clerk's office, and I saw it. And you can see where it's easily it was uh, photoshopped. <laughs> That's the cool part of that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Thank you for the presentation with the fine visuals. Another comment. Okay, that's what we got for now. I enjoyed that book, Rebels and Tories. I thought that was a, it was complicated as a hard read, but it was, uh, it was interesting. You know, it was, it was well done, Nate, and we're going to try to get uh, that author, that's the guy, right, uh, down here in July. Uh, we'll have a book signing. So we're working on that for future. Yep. He would be a great part of our event to have that yeah. book, the book signing and Gary Dye. The, the uh, Rebel and the the Rebel and the Tory, Ethan Allen, Philip Skeen, and the Dawn of Vermont is a three-page book review as well in the brand new edition of Vermont History, the winter spring 2021 edition of Vermont History, the scholarly publication. Okay. Check that out. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if there's uh, no more questions, um, we can uh, announce a couple things. Uh, next month's meeting is going to be uh, by Jane Radosia on April 18th at 2 p.m. Um, it's good. She's a, she is a, a, an architect specializing in old houses, and um, she's an architectural historian. And um, she's going to talk about really uh, architecture and technology changes. What could we build? You know, Bennington's got a lot of beautiful buildings, and um, she's going to talk about why these styles change, why construction change, and um, difference in materials, tools, and technology, power tools, and this and that. So um, using local uh, buildings as an example, she's going to explore the changes in these technologies from the 1760s up to the 1920s. So that should be very interesting. That's going to be uh, April 18th at 2 p.m. And uh, that'll be a Zoom, a recorded Zoom as well. Um, also, I'd like to remind you that at 4 o'clock, Ethan Allen Homestead is going to have a presentation on uh, historic treasures in the state archives. That's at 4 p.m. You can go to the um, ethanallenhomestead.org to get details on that and to get the links. So that's another thing you can do. Um, so I guess that's, uh, that's all I got to say is, and thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And Dina for setting this up, uh, doing the technology behind all this. And let um, me just check for any more comments here. Thank you. Nice job. Um, more kudos, I guess. So, so thanks, everybody. And um, 
We'll see you in the next Zoom, and someday we'll do a face-to-face -face presentation as well. So I guess that's it. All the best. Go outside and sit in the sun. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Very informative. Appreciate it. Andrew Shaw. Is that the Andrew Shaw from the insurance company? I used to work with you, I think. He's gone. All right, um, Bob, I had some technical issues midway through that, so I missed a couple sections of the recording. Okay, um, I, noticed, I noticed you something flashed up, made you host or something for a while or something. I was just really glad that we didn't lose everybody when that happened. My internet went out. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Um, but I will probably, I'll, I'll connect with Bob and maybe just have him redo the parts that I missed um, so that we can, I can oh, then boy. edit it together and yeah. <laughs> we'll have the whole program available. Okay. I didn't notice any blip in the present. Well, I might not. I didn't notice any, it went smoothly on my end, so. But good. <laughs> That's the important part. Okay, well, it went good. I think we covered everything. And um, it was good. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I will um, end the meeting and I will look forward to talking with you about the next one. Okay. Okay. okay take care. We're working on that one. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Take care. Later.